The Ancient City, Book 3, Chapter 12, The Citizen and the Stranger. The citizen was recognized by the fact that he had a part in the religion of the city, and it was from this participation that he derived all his civil and political rights. If he renounced the worship, he renounced the rights. We have already spoken of the public meals, which were the principal ceremony of the national worship. Now, at Sparta, one who did not join in these, even if it was not his fault, ceased at once to be counted among the citizens. At Athens, one who did not take part in the festivals of the national gods lost the rights of a citizen. At Rome, it was necessary to have been present at the sacred ceremony of the lustration in order to enjoy political rights. The man who had not taken part in this, that is to say, who had not joined in the common prayer and the sacrifice, lost his citizenship until the next lustration. If we wished to give an exact definition of a citizen, we should say that it was a man who had the religion of the city. The stranger, on the contrary, is one who has not access to the worship, one whom the gods of the city do not protect, and who has not even the right to invoke them. For these national gods do not wish to receive prayers and offering except from citizens. They repulse the stranger. Entrance into their temples is forbidden to him, and his presence during the sacrifice is a sacrilege. Evidence of this ancient sentiment of repulsion has remained in one of the principal rites of Roman worship. The pontiff, when he sacrifices in the open air, must have his head veiled. For before the sacred fires in the religious act which is offered to the national gods, the face of a stranger must not appear to the pontiff, the auspices would be disturbed. A sacred object which fell for a moment into the hands of a stranger at once became profane. It could not recover its religious character except by an expiatory ceremony. If the enemy seized a city and the citizens succeeded in recovering it, above all things it was important that the temples should be purified and all the fires extinguished and rekindled. The presence of the stranger had defiled them. Thus religion established between the citizen and the stranger a profound and ineffaceable distinction. This same religion, so long as it held sway over the minds of men, forbade the right of citizenship to be granted to a stranger. In the time of Herodotus, Sparta had accorded it to no one except a prophet, and even for this the formal command of the oracle was necessary. Athens granted it sometimes, but with what precautions? First, it was necessary that the united people should vote by secret ballot for the admission of the stranger. Even this was nothing as yet. Nine days afterwards, a second assembly had to confirm the previous vote, and in this second case, 6,000 votes were required in favor of the admission, a number which will appear enormous when we recollect that it was very rare for an Athenian assembly to comprise so many citizens. After this, a vote of the Senate was required to confirm the decision of this double assembly. Finally, any citizen could oppose a sort of veto and attack the decree as contrary to the ancient laws. Certainly there was no other public act where the legislator was surrounded with so many difficulties and precautions as that which conferred upon a stranger the title of citizen. The formalities to go through were not near so great in declaring war or in passing a new law. Why should these men oppose so many obstacles to a stranger who wished to become a citizen? Assuredly they did not fear that in the political assemblies his vote would turn the balance. Demosthenes gives us the true motive and the true thought of the Athenians. It is because the purity of the sacrifices must be preserved. To exclude the stranger was to watch over the sacred ceremonies. To admit a stranger among the citizens was to give him a part in the religion and in the sacrifices. Now for such an act the people did not consider themselves entirely free and were seized with religious scruples, for they knew that the national gods were disposed to repulse the stranger and that the sacrifices would perhaps be rendered useless by the presence of the newcomer.
the gift of the rights of a citizen to a stranger was a real violation of the fundamental principles of the national religion, and it is for this reason that, in the beginning, the city was so sparing of it. We must also note that the man admitted to citizenship with so much difficulty could be neither archon nor priest. The city indeed permitted him to take part in its worship, but as to presiding at it, that would have been too much. No one could become a citizen of Athens if he was a citizen of in another city, for it was a religious impossibility to be at the same time a member of two cities, as it also was to be a member of two families. One could not have two religions at the same time. The participation in the worship carried with it the possession of rights. As the citizen might assist in the sacrifice which preceded the assembly, he could also vote at the assembly. As he could perform the sacrifices in the name of the city, he might be a praetane and an archon. Having the religion of the city, he might claim rights under its laws and perform all the ceremonies of legal procedure. The stranger, on the contrary, having no part in the religion, had none in the law. If he entered the sacred enclosure which the priests had traced for the assembly, he was punished with death. The laws of the city did not exist for him. If he had committed a crime, he was treated as a slave and punished without process of law, the city owing him no legal protection. When men arrived at that stage that they felt the need of having laws for the stranger, it was necessary to establish an exceptional tribunal. At Rome, in order to judge the alien, the praetor had to become an alien himself, praetor peregrinus. At Athens, the judge of foreigners was the polemarch, that is to say, the magistrate who was charged with cares of war and of all transactions with the enemy. Neither at Rome nor at Athens could a foreigner be a proprietor. He could not marry. Or, if he married, his marriage was not recognized, and his children were reputed illegitimate. He could not make a contract with a citizen. At any rate, the law did not recognize such a contract as valid. At first he could take no part in commerce. The Roman law forbade him to inherit from a citizen, and even forbade a citizen to inherit from him. They pushed this principle so far that if a foreigner obtained the rights of a citizen without his son, born before this event, obtaining the same favor, the son became a foreigner in regard to his father and could not inherit from him. The distinction between citizen and foreigner was stronger than the natural tie between father and son. At first blush, it would seem as if the aim had been to establish a system that should be vexatious towards foreigners. But there was nothing of this. Athens and Rome, on the contrary, gave him a good reception, both for commercial and political reasons. But neither their goodwill nor their interest could abolish the ancient laws which religion had established. This religion did not permit the stranger to become a proprietor, because he could not have any part in the religious soil of the city. It permitted neither the foreigner to inherit from the citizen, nor the citizen to inherit from the foreigner because every transmission of property carried with it the transmission of a worship, and it was as impossible for the citizen to perform the foreigner's worship as for the foreigner to perform the citizen's. Citizens could welcome the foreigner, watch over him, even esteem him if he was rich and honorable, but they could give him no part in their religion or their laws. The slave, in certain respects, was better treated than he was, because the slave, being a member of the family whose worship he shared, was connected with the city through his master. The gods protected him. The Roman religion taught, therefore, that the tomb of the slave was sacred, but that the foreigner's was not. A foreigner, to be of any account in the eyes of the law, to be enabled to engage in trade, to make contracts, to enjoy his property securely, to have the benefit of the laws of the city to protect him, must become the client of a citizen. Rome and Athens required every foreigner to adopt a patron. By choosing a citizen as a patron, the foreigner became connected with the city. Thenceforth, he participated in some of the benefits of the civil law, and its protection was secured. <laughs>